So up to this point, we've covered the basics of threading. How do you spawn a thread? What are some of the core threading mechanisms? We've talked about spin locks. We've talked about atomic operations, atomic classes, a little tiny bit about atomic variables, like volatile. We've talked a bit about the uh, semaphore class. You've learned what a semaphore is. That's what you should be doing for the next assignment 1B that's due shortly. What we're going to do now is we're going to switch gears and talk about something called the Java Executor Framework. And as you can see from this subset of the classes that are in the Java Executor Framework, there's a lot of stuff here. We're going to cover most of these by the time we're done. We won't do it all today, of course. But um, you'll learn what the Java Executor Framework is. In a nutshell, its purpose is to decouple thread creation and management activities and actions from all the rest of the application logic. And I'll talk about the different types of thread pools that the Java Executor Framework supports. We'll talk about fixed size thread pools. We'll talk about hashed or variable size thread pools. We'll talk about work stealing thread pools. And each of these has classes that are implementing those capabilities as part of Java. And I'll give you a simple example of a human known use of a thread pool, which you've undoubtedly run across at some point along the way. So as you can see from this diagram, the Java Executor Framework provides lots of classes and interfaces. Um, we'll talk about some of the core ones very quickly in this intro. We'll talk about the interfaces and just a little bit about how it's organized in terms of a hierarchy. But like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's also a class called the Executors class. And this is a common convention used in a lot of Java. They'll often have a bunch of interfaces, and then they'll have a class like there's the executor interface, and there's the executor service interface, and there's the scheduled executor service interface, and so on and so forth. And then there'll be another class that typically ends in an S. And in this case, it's the executor's class. And this is what's called a utility class. And so the utility classes in Java, in this case, provide ways of being able to access and manage instances of the Java executor framework. A utility class in general in Java is a final class. That means it's not capable of being extended. That has only static methods, no non-static state, no non-static fields, and a private constructor. And so what it really is is it's, it's really just Java's way of having a group of functions that are nestled inside of a class, because that's how Java likes to do things. It likes to put everything in classes. If this was C or C++, we could have you know, a package or a file that would just have a bunch of functions. But Java doesn't work that way. So if you want kind of functions in Java, you can make utility classes. Its factory methods provide a means to create various kinds of thread pools. So as we'll see as we go through this, you can make fixed thread pools and cache thread pools and work stealing pools and uh, scheduled thread pools and so on and so forth. And I'll explain what all those things are later. But the main point there is that there are factory methods that make stuff. And you probably remember the factory method pattern from your patterns course or other reading you may have done. It's just a way of separating the creation of an object from the use of the created object. So you can kind of hide the implementation details in a nice, clean, easy to access way. So what is a thread pool and why do we need them? Well, first of all, concurrent programs often are designed to handle a large number of clients. So imagine a web server that's going to have to access many different or handle many different client requests simultaneously. So you might imagine like the, the Olympics website where there's going to be gazillions of people all coming to see who, who won the, the gold medal in various events. If you tried to spawn a thread for every client request, when you had a lot of clients trying to access the system, it might start to get overburdened. Why, why would that be the case? Well, whenever you spawn a thread for each client, and there's lots of clients, there could be a lot of memory overhead. You have to have a thread for each client, and a thread takes up a non-trivial amount of virtual memory and real memory. You may also have just you know, large tables full of threads you have to keep track of, most of which aren't really doing anything useful unless you have thousands of cores, which is unlikely uh, in many cases. And so it's just extra work to also to have to spawn these things on demand. Every time a request comes in, you have to spawn a new thread, which takes some time. And as we, see, as we will see, making a new thread is not a cheap thing to do. So it could take extra time. It could use a lot of memory. It could be wasteful. 
So what's a better way to do things? Well, one way to do things is to use a pool of threads. So what you're going to do is you're going to pre-spawn a pool of threads and then reuse those threads to handle the different requests that come in. Why is this a win, you ask? Well, it's a win because it amortizes the overhead of creating threads or starting threads or spawning threads, whatever you want to say, launching threads. It amortizes that. So you create the things typically at the beginning of the program. And once they're up and running, then as the requests come in, they're already started. So you don't have to waste time starting them. And of course, the other thing is you can also you know, sort of put a bound on the size of the pool. So you don't use an excessive amount of resources. Well, that of course raises the question, how big should the pool size be? And as we'll see shortly, the pool size is determined by various factors, like how many cores do you have? Or are your threads I.O. bound? Are they sitting there you know, reading and writing from disks or the network? Or are they compute bound? Are they sitting there crunching through analyses in memory? And those different factors, as we will see shortly, have an impact on how many threads that you ought to have in your pool. And there's actually a formula we'll talk about later. The Java Executor Framework supports multiple types of thread pools. The three most common types will be what we'll cover. So perhaps the simplest type is the fixed size thread pool. And what you do there is you give it a fixed number of threads to pre-spawn when you create the thread pool, and then that will amortize that creation overhead, meaning that once they're created, you don't have to recreate them. They can be reused. So here's a very simple example where we're going to go ahead and use the new fixed thread pool factory method from the executor's utility class, and we're going to make some number of threads. Let's, let's assume this is a constant. S max threads could be four or six or eight or whatever. And we're going to make that executor. And then when we have work to do, rather than spawning a new thread, we're simply going to create a task. This make request runnable is a factory method that returns a task. We'll talk more about what a task is later. And it basically goes ahead and queues that task up to be executed at some point in the executor. So these tasks that we're executing will be queued up. And then when there's a thread available in the pool of threads, that thread will go ahead and do its thing. If you have compute-bound tasks, these are the ones that are not blocking on I.O. So something that's going to be going through and you know, calculating the greatest common divisor, or determining if a number is prime, or anything that's compute-bound, doesn't have to access the file system uh, directly, or doesn't have to access the network directly. You typically want to have roughly as many threads in your thread pool as there are cores on your chipset, on your CPU. Give or take, you know, I mean, roughly, you could make a, make a couple extra threads. It's not going to hurt anything, but matching the number of threads to the number of cores for compute-bound tasks makes a lot of sense. Uh, I should also hasten to add that you, you don't always want to have as many compute-bound threads as there are cores if there's some reason you want to reserve some of the cores for other stuff. So you should have as many threads in your thread pool as there are cores you want to devote to whatever problem you're trying to solve. And compute-bound tasks are essentially sort of run to completion tasks. Once they start running, they'll just keep running and they won't typically block. Conversely, IO-bound tasks are more complicated to determine the size of the pool. So what's an IO-bound task? Well, anytime you're you know, downloading something from a website, that's typically an IO-bound task, at least part of it's IO-bound, the part where you're downloading the content. If you're downloading a big file um, or you're streaming something, there's some time spent you know, getting the data from the network into your computer. Likewise, if you're reading and writing to databases, there's some time spent reading and writing from the databases. And you probably don't think about this too much, but if you stop and think, the way that threading works in modern operating systems is when a thread goes to do an I.O. operation, it, the operating system will put that thread to sleep until the operation is done. And the reason for that is that while you're waiting for I.O., it's actually a fairly long amount of time in the grand scheme of things as far as how fast processors run or cores run. And so as a result, there's no sense in you know, keeping that core idle, waiting. Get that thread out of there and let somebody else run. You might have a better chance of making forward progress. So I.O.-bound tasks typically need more threads than compute-bound tasks. And the question is, how many more threads? And here is a formula that we'll talk about that gives you a hint as to this. And the, the big thing to keep in mind is that we want to keep the cores as utilized as possible. 
So the goal in doing this, the goal of having these extra threads is to try to keep as much stuff going through the system as we can. So here's the formula. It's n, where n is the number of cores, times 1 plus wt over st. So that, of course, raises the question, what is wt and what's st? Well, wt is wait time. That's how much time you're noticing or you're, you measure or you estimate that the thread, a given thread, will wait, in other words, wait for I.O., versus the amount of time taken to actually do the service once it's not waiting, once it's got the data it wants. So ST is service time. How long does it actually take to comp compute once it's got the data it needs to do its work? And WT, which is how long did it take to wait to get the work? OK, so um, here's the way to look at this. If, if the wait time is very low, like let's say, for sake of argument, wait time is one second, and service time is very long, like a minute, then this number here will be very small, right? WT over ST will be very low. So what you're going to get there is roughly n threads in your thread pool. So if, if you're not waiting very much, then you can pretty much get by with as many cores, as many threads as there are cores. Conversely, if you're waiting a long time relative to the service time, this number gets larger, right? WT is going to be bigger. So let's say, for sake of argument, that you spend 10 seconds waiting and one second doing work. So then that would be 10 over 1, which is 10. So now it's going to be 1 plus 10 times n. So that'll give you a bigger number. So the bottom line here is if you spend a lot of time waiting, then you're going to need more threads in your pool in order to keep the processor fully utilized. And remember this, because later we're going to talk about various heuristics that are used, to tr or various other techniques that are used to try to expand the size of the number of threads in the pool automatically when someone waits. So remember that the longer you wait, the more threads you're going to need to utilize the system. This, of course, also raises the question, how the heck do you figure out what, the, uh, what WT and S and T are, or ST are? And, and one way you could do that is you could profile your system. You could run it you know, during you know, the average load, or you could do some testing, a testing framework to see how long those values should be based on traffic patterns that would mimic what you expect to be encountered in a real system. You could also actually measure those things in a real system and then see how it was, your system was behaving over time. If you have fixed size thread pools that have bounded queues, in other words, queues that only have you know, n elements into them, or m elements. Let's not confuse n with the number of cores, but m, where m is some fixed value, some bounded value. You can end up with deadlock. And I'll talk more about the deadlock problems a little bit later uh, when we talk in detail about the different mechanisms in Java. So those are fixed size pools. So, so fixed size, as we will see, it's real easy to use. It's pretty efficient in one sense. If you pick n to be right, then you know, you've got those threads allocated. Once they're allocated, they stay allocated. Um, but there are some downsides to them. Like, what is n? <laughs> That's the big question. Um, and sometimes you don't know, you just, sometimes you don't really know what WT and ST are because you don't know your workload until the work starts to come in. Um, that's why, by the way, if you, uh, you know, if you ever try to get a plumber to come to your house to fix a leak, or if you ever try to get someone to, you know, install something, they typically tell you, we'll be there between noon and four, right? Why do they say that? Because they don't really know how long the job is going to take that came before you. So if it's an easy job, you know, if, if every job took 15 minutes, you could tell people very specifically how long it was going to take. But in practice, that's usually not the case. So as a result, you say, well, between noon and four. And that gives you some, that gives them some additional slop in case things don't work out quite the way they expect it. All right, so the next form of thread pool are called cache thread pools. And the way this works is a new thread is created on demand in response to new client requests. So this is actually starting to move back in the direction of a thread per request, although we'll see it's not quite that excessive. Uh, and the reason it's not quite as excessive as thread per request is once a thread has been created, then it hangs around for a while. So if new requests show up and their threads, previously created threads that are there to ha handle them, they'll get to get chance to get reused. They don't get started and stopped for every request. So it's possible to be more 
space and time conserving with a cached thread pool. The way you do this is by using the new cache thread pool factory method, which makes you a cache thread pool. And then when you execute requests, the way it works, as we'll see in more detail when we look at the implementation, a new thread is created for, for each request if there is not already one in the pool to handle it. If the threads are not used, you know, as the pool, the pool will grow when there's bursts of data, bursts of requests, and then over time, if the threads aren't, if they remain idle for a certain amount of time, let's say a minute or whatever, then the system will start to shut them down. So these systems kind of, you know, take a little bit of time to auto tune themselves, then they work during the burst, and then they kind of shut themselves down little by little. Um, an example of something like this, if you've ever gone to a supermarket, like Publix, um, what you'll typically notice is that they'll have a handful of people at the cash register. They'll usually have like what, you know, 12 lanes or 12 cash register um, stations. But at any given point in time, there might just be a handful of people working there. But then if it's, you know, like the day before the Super Bowl or if people are worried it's going to snow and there's a run in the store and everybody freaks out and panics, um, what do they do? They say, you know, uh, Josie, come to the front, or we need all the, all the stockers to come to the front to, to work the cash registers, right? So that's an example where they bring people from other parts of the store, and then they start using more of those lanes. And then once the burst is over, they're like, okay, you know, go back and stock some more, go back and do other things. You don't have to sit here when there's nobody there. So that, that's a simple example of kind of expanding and contracting the number of, of threads or workers dynamically. The nice thing about caching is you don't really have to estimate the size of the pool. It'll, it'll be determined for you as the work shows up. The downside is you've got to create these new threads. And so you're creating them on the fly. And, and yes, they stick around, but you're still having to create them on the fly. So you're not quite getting the benefits of amortization unless you're able to reuse them during these bursts. The third type of thread pool we're going to cover, and this is a more advanced type of pool, is something called the fork join pool. And, um, We'll kind of dis I'll kind of see how much time I'll have to cover that in this class. That's really a topic I like to cover on my other course on parallel Java computing, which we'll do in the fall. So if we have time, we'll cover this. If we don't have time, you can always go watch the videos from last year to see what I covered. But basically, this is the coolest form of thread pool, and it's called the fork join pool. And it supports something known as work stealing queues. And I'll explain briefly what a work stealing queue is in a second. So here you, you call the new work stealing pool factory method, which makes you a fork join pool thread implementation, which comes back just like all the other ones do through the executor interface, although you can use it other ways as well. And when you execute a request, then some interesting things happen with this. The long and the short of it is that work is handed off to typically to the, the deck where, or sorry, each thread in the thread pool has this deck. What is a deck? A deck is a double-ended queue. And a double-ended queue, as the name implies, allows you to efficiently put stuff and take stuff from the head of the queue and put stuff and take stuff from the tail of the queue. So you can put things at the beginning, you can put things at the end, you can take things off the beginning, you can take things off the end. And that's all done very efficiently because of the way the data structure works. And you can imagine it's something like a doubly linked list with head and tail operations. It's also got a lot of other cool stuff that we won't have time to talk about at the moment, but if we have time later, it's really, really interesting about how it works from a concurrency point of view and synchronization point of view. So the long and the short of it is stuff is put onto a deck. And, and I won't go into great detail about how you break the work up into chunks, but let's assume that there's decks full of stuff to process. And when a thread doesn't have anything else to do, a, a worker thread in the, in the pool, it goes and it looks at its deck and it says, is there anything for me to work on? If the answer is yes, it takes it off and it processes it. Um, if the answer is no, there's nothing for that thread in the pool to work on, it doesn't just stop running. Instead, it looks at the end of other threads' decks and tries to steal their work. And the idea there is that if, if they're busy doing something else and they've got stuff to do, and this guy doesn't have anything to do, then this worker thread will go steal the work from the end of somebody else's uh, deck. And the idea here, remember, is to keep the cores as utilized as possible. And there's all kinds of cool things related to this that, again, we may have time to go into in more detail. But the long and the short of it is that this model sort of self-optimizes and self-tunes the system to try to keep as many things going on as, as possible. 
And uh, again, it's, it's really interesting how all this stuff works, but in a nutshell, uh, because removing things from the end of the deck and adding and removing things from the front of the deck are often done by multiple threads without actually having to contend for the same um, items. You can actually use different locks at the head and different locks at the tail. And as long as there's more than one item in the, in the deck, they can proceed without interfering with each other. So it reduces lock contention. There's all kinds of reasons why fork join pool and decks that work stealing queues are really cool. The pool defaults to all the available cores as its target parallelism level. So if you just make a fork join pool out of the box and you have n cores, there'll be n worker threads in that pool. And uh, we'll talk, if we have time later, about how the system under the hood tries to allocate new threads and add them to the pool whenever operations would block. So that's a way of trying to keep things uh, moving and, and again, keep the system and the core as busy as possible. The nice thing about a fork join pool is it kind of strikes a good balance between a fixed size thread pool where you have a fixed amount and a variable size thread pool where you keep spawning new threads. So this guy, this approach will try to reuse existing threads and only spawn if it really, really, really has to. And it's kind of adaptive in that way. There are other ways to implement thread pools as well. They're described in some papers that I've written many years ago and appear in some books I wrote. Um, there's something called the half sync, half async strategy. There's the leader follower strategy. I'm just mentioning this as an aside. You will not be quizzed on these, this particular set of topics. It's just that if anybody has interest in learning more about thread pools, this is a place to go for more. Okay, so I always like to know, I always like to give people human known uses of stuff wherever possible because I find it sometimes helps make the mysterious world of parallelism and concurrency a little bit more approachable because you can relate it to things you, you interact with in everyday life. So what's a good example of a thread pool? Well, a call center is a good example. So undoubtedly, you, you've called a call center if you want to you know, dispute your credit card bill or you need to talk to somebody about your taxes or you want to buy tickets and you want to call Ticketmaster, whatever. They'll have call centers where Operators are standing by. Did we get the, the pun? Operators are standing by, right? Um, and the, in this call center will be humans, and there'll be a, a call distribution system that will route incoming calls to the next available operator. And when you call a call center and somebody's there, they pick up the phone pretty much right away. If all operators are busy, then you're stuck into a queue, and they always say, you know, do not hang up and redial because calls are serviced in the order received, or something like that. So pretty much the same idea. You've got a pool of people. They take their turns um, in the call center. This is a very early call center, which was actually a switching system back in the day where people would actually literally physically connect the lines by plugging stuff in with um, patch cords. And uh, there was one point in time, this is quite a long time ago, probably you know, 70 years ago or so, people were worried that, that everybody in America would have to be a telephone switchboard operator to handle the scalability of the demand for the telephone. Well, needless to say, uh, we automated it, and that didn't happen. But it's always funny when people think, you know, oh, we're going to have to turn everybody into, you know, testers, or we're going to have to tell, turn everybody into programmers, or whatever. Inevitably, somebody comes along and, and automates stuff. Um, okay, so that's the end of part one of this lesson. And I will be happy to take questions, and of course, we'll have our discussion in a moment.